with verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed. What two wonderful words. Grace speaks of a gift. Bestowed speaks of a gift on the churches of Macedonia, Thessalonica, Philippi, Berea. That in a great trial of affliction in the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, that is their means, their power, yes and beyond their means, ability, power, they were freely willing, nobody prompting, nobody reminding, just free will, what they desired to do in their heart. Imploring us, begging us, entreating us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So they didn't see giving as just giving. They saw it as a partnership and a service. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us, the apostles, by the will of God. Father, speak into our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. Now, picking up where we left off, let me talk to you about the encouragement of grace. The encouragement of grace is seen in a serving heart. I mentioned this in the 11 o'clock service. I didn't even get this far in this service. In verse number 4, the Bible says, imploring us with much urgency uh, that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. The word imploring there would best translate in the vernacular that you and I would most readily understand as begging. Begging insistently for the privilege. Now you say, what are they begging for? One year prior to Paul challenging the church at Macedonia, the church at Corinth had become aware, and by the way, they were a very well-to-do church. They had become aware of the need of the poor Jews during a time of destitution in Jerusalem. And so they had said, we're going to give an offering. But a year later, they had not done it. By the way, that's another picture of grace. Grace brings action with your thoughts. There's too many of us that will go through life with good intentions that will never become reality. What makes a difference is when your thoughts, your considerations uh, take on feet and prayer and life and engage that which God's called you to. So here's a church, Corinth, that ought to go. The Macedonian churches are not on the radar screen because they have their problems themselves. They have their own deep poverty, which they wanted to show them that the grace of God was sufficient to allow them to rise above it. And so they responded in such a wonderful way that now Paul and Titus is using the church at Macedonia to spur the church of Corinth on. And I'm going to make a statement, and you challenge if it's biblical or not. You mean to tell me that the Spirit of God allowed one church to be challenged by another church's giving? Absolutely. I wonder if God ever uses one person's giving to be a challenge to someone else's giving. You may not have known what they gave, but somehow or another you found out, and you were impressed and challenged by their gift and here's what they were doing the macedonia church are you with me beg to be involved it's almost as they're on their knees and they're pleading they say we know you're taking an offering and it's almost as though they're saying yeah but we don't really expect you to be involved and they said hold on just a minute i beg you let me be involved please 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 let me give one must open their heart to receive his grace and in return he opens our hands I've never known a heart open to Jesus that had closed hands I really believe that I'm a recipient of the grace of God anybody here come in you, you have your I, I believe God has been good to me I, I believe what the Bible says in uh, James 1 17 and 18 that every good and perfect gift that I have comes down from above God has given me life he's put uh, air in these lungs he's put incredible enthusiasm and passion in this 
body called humanity. I, I praise his dear name for the words he puts into my mouth, for the word that he gave us to put in our mouths. And so I've experienced the grace of God, and I've found through the grace of God, if we'll keep our hands open, it is amazing what God will allow to, to transport its way through our hands as a, as a funnel into other people's lives for the glory of God. It only stands to reason if God's given me something and I close my fist, two things. Number one, I can't give it. And number two, I can't receive more. And I become uh, clutch fist and kind of clammed up. I told you this morning I wanted to talk to you out of an illustration that I got from my friend David Jeremiah. He did a study on pockets. And I thought, well, that'll be interesting. This is going to bless you. The earliest pockets were not like we have. You know, I, check it out. Pocket. Got one here. Watch this. Pockets. I've got all these pockets. Hey, look at this. Pocket. Guess where the first pockets were that we have any record of in history? This will change your life. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the first pockets were like belts on the outside carried, and we pulled our clothing over it. We wouldn't know them today as, what were they called, fanny packs? You didn't know how old they were, did you? When you see someone, one of them, you need to say, is that original? <laughs> and they're 170 years, they're from the 1700s. They are. All right, then guess what else they did? Then they took Mark, and they got a belt to go on the inside under their waist pants and it had a pocket on it so you stuck it down in there and so that was the first pockets but sometime in the 1700s pockets as we know them today came into being but they were very different from our early forms of pocket that was a small bag or purse or hung from one's belt or even around one's neck they would carry it but some suggested sewing the pockets right inside the slit in the pants so that one's hand went directly into the pocket to which they said, brilliant. Now, I, I never thought about that. When I put these pants on this morning, I didn't pray, Lord, where did this come from? I mean, now, as only uh, a sanctified imagination could go, I want to show you something that re Lord really used to speak to my heart in a really... Um, non-traditional way. Jer David Jeremiah said he's found five different kinds of money in our pockets that we can use as God directs. You ready? Number one, invisible money. He said this is money that you have, but you don't have it to spend as you would like. He said think about the five dollars your mom gave you when you went on a field trip in elementary school. Now David, and you know what I like about his story? It didn't say now Johnny. Now, David, don't lose this money or spend it. Take it to school and give it to your teacher. Understand? For a brief time, that money was in my possession, but it was not mine to spend as I wish. It was designated for a purpose. Ultimately, I received the benefit of the trip, but when I handed the money to my teacher, I lost control of it. Invisible money. 10% of a Christian's money income should be invisible money. It is in your possession for a while before you turn it back over to the Lord. It's God's tithe. It is the tenth of all that he gives us and it belongs to him anyway. Now I wanna say something to every one of you. I believe the Bible is as clear as it can be. I've heard more arguments. That's Old Testament law. Can I say something to you? The tithe came 400 years before the law. God bless you. People have tried every way they can. Can we weasel around this? Can we theologically steal and feel good about it? The tithe belongs to the Lord. Let me say something to you. You have no right of designating your tithe. It is God's money. The tithe belongs to the Lord. What right do I have to tell God what to do with what is his? And so I think that a, a Christian ought to tithe. Number two, there's not just invisible money, there is pocket money. Now, we usually think of pocket money as the change, the coins we carry in our pockets or purse, and it doesn't usually add up to a lot of money, and it's money we are comfortable giving on a moment's notice, like the one-time gift the Philippians sent, carried by Epaphroditus to the Apostle Paul in a Roman jail. 
There ought to be this category of money we give above and beyond our tithe. Money that we feel free to give generously and willingly whenever a, a need arises. So perhaps a collection is being taken up to help meet the need of a Sunday school class member or a love offering is being collected for a visiting missionary or perhaps a neighborhood child comes to your door selling candy or wrapping paper to help her school. This pocket money and the amount will vary for each of us, it's money that we're free to say, sure, I'll be glad to help when someone is in need. So I believe as a child of God, that's the grace of God offered in my life. I, I, I have invisible money. I give my tithe every week. That's not mine. If, if there's a special need in my Sunday school offering, in Sunday school and there's an offering, let me tell you, Lord, what I never do. I never take my tithe check. Look, watch, stay with me. Stay with me and mark through the tithe, Charlene, and write down there, designated to Sunday school need. I never do that. It's not mine to do that with. I, I personally am of the conviction that it's a sin for me to do that. Personally. You don't have to buy into that, but I'm just telling you, I've been your preacher a long time. For what it's worth, it's God's money. So I, if I ain't got no pocket money, I ain't going to be able to give that day. Pocket money, I'm going to give over above. Number three is wallet money. Now, I'm referring to a wallet because that's where we keep bills, folding money, George and the families, the presidential paper. This is a bit more serious money than pocket money. It takes a deeper commitment to spend wallet money than pocket money. In my mind, this is the kind of money the Corinthians set aside at the first of every week to prepare for the collection that Paul was taking for the needs of the church in Jerusalem, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Uh, this was a long-term commitment, not an impulsive gift. Uh, wallet money is probably a sacrificial gift, one that requires you to choose to give up one thing in order to accomplish another. It's like, I'm going to cut down in my expenses here because I believe God wants me to give some serious money, wallet money, to this particular need. And the only way I can do it is for something to be removed. And so we do it. Number four, there's check money. Uh, money that we don't carry around with us, but which we spend by writing a check. Uh, this is giving that cost at a higher level altogether. Maybe, for instance, we pray about making a two-year commitment to support a missionary every month or a decision that represents several thousands of dollars. Or you hear about a widow in your church whose furnace is just broken down in the middle of the winter and must be replaced. So you and another business associate decide the Lord has, God has so blessed you that the two of you get together and say, let's, let's uh, pull our money together and let's meet that need. You write a check and I'll write a check. You give beyond what you would ordinarily give for the sake of someone who is in need, just as the Macedonians did when they learned that their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem were in need. Number five, they're serious money. Some of you are thinking, I'm glad this is the last one. <laughs> I'm broke, and he ain't through with the sermon. Uh, serious money. That's not to say, by the way, that the previous four categories aren't serious. All money belongs to God, so all of it is serious. And by the way, when I say the tithe is the Lord's, that's what he's asked. All of it is his. You ought to thank God that he lets you handle 90% of it. But when you give serious money, you're saying, Lord, it all belongs to you as a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. I acknowledge that all I have comes from you and is yours to spend. Feel free to ask for any or all that I have, and I will obey. David gave serious money when he emptied his personal treasure to build the first temple in Jerusalem. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And Paul left behind serious money along with everything else in the world when he made, knowing, made the knowing Christ the sole purpose of his life. Uh, for the individual who has given their life to Christ, Paul says, giving up earthly things to gain heavenly things is a sign of maturity. So the question begs, what's in your pocket? The world we live in says that full pockets are a sign of intelligence, diligence, and prosperity. But in the kingdom of God, it's empty pockets that are praised. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus never praised the rich for having full pockets after giving, but he did praise a poor widow whose pockets were empty after she gave her last two pennies. 
If we're generous people before the Lord, we will commit to giving him our invisible money. Then sometimes we'll add, he'll ask us to give our pocket money, sometimes wallet money, occasionally check money, and then that one-time gift of serious money. In fact, if we reserve the order, reverse it, and give God our serious money first, the rest of the giving will flow like a stream of living water. Let me talk to you about the fact that this enthusiastic giving was a sacred trust. The Bible refers to it in verse 4 as the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Uh, these Macedonian believers, so Paul says, inspired by God, that it was seen as a partnership. The gift that it refers to is grace, this fruit of God's work within them. The Bible refers to their giving, listen to this, as a fellowship. That's the word for koinonia. It means that they saw it as a partnership. God is giving me the privilege to partner in the work of the Lord, to help others. So sometimes I am made aware, and you are also, through Sunday school, through our missions conference, uh, through meeting church planners, through meeting missionaries from around the world, we become aware of needs, and then what we do, we partner with them and say, I want to join you in this partnership in allowing you to accomplish God's purpose in your life in this part of the world. So they pressed it on as a favor to them to take and convey this grace prompt collection. Now, let me give you a fifth uh, statement, and this is where we'll spend a little time, and I'll be through. Let me close tonight by talking about the example of grace. The Bible makes it clear, first of all, when they gave themselves to the Lord. They just thought maybe they'd give themselves to the offering, but they didn't do as we had hoped. They did not do as we had hoped. They gave themselves first to the Lord, then to us, by the will of God. So, first of all, they were at God's disposal. The basis for their action was more impressive to Paul than their generous gift. Remember, we're talking about what grace does in a person's life. We're not just talking about the gift. We're talking about this is what grace looks like. No gift, oh, I love this statement. No gift can be in any real sense a gift unless the giver gives with it a bit of himself. The Corinthians had been the first to feel the appeal of this need. I told you that. The tragedy of life so often is not that we have no high impulses, but that we fail to turn them into actions. How many people have said this? You know, I'm glad I finally did this. I felt I should have done it 10 years ago. One dear friend, he has become a dear friend, and I love him as a friend, said to me recently, God led me to this church 19 years ago. And instead of doing what the impulse of the Spirit of God led me to do, I went a different direction. And with tears in his eyes, he said, I'm here now. And if you'll take us, we'll serve God in this fellowship for the rest of our life. Oftentimes, some of you said you moved to this community and you thought this church is too big. And instead of asking God what he thinks, and the next time you think the church is too big, do you think you're going to feel at home in heaven? Thank God for a big church. If that, if that church represents the body of Christ and people that have been snatched from hell and have given their heart to Christ, God may call our churches big. Matter of fact, I'm telling you, it's one of the most carnal statements I've ever heard. There's no such thing as a church being too big. I feel better. I'll sleep better tonight. So there was a total commitment to Christ in response to grace. And by the way, listen to this. This was a response to Christ because of grace, not because of the need. I read nothing in this passage where they, where they cried and said, oh, we're so concerned about the people in Jerusalem. What are we going to do? No, this is grace operative in their life. This is loving God in their life. This is more about embracing Jesus. You may say, now, Pastor... The Bible says they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. Now, this is Paul speaking. Do you think Paul had anybody in particular in mind? I think he did. I think he could have said, go with me to Acts chapter 19 and let me introduce you to a fellow by the name of Aristarchus. Let me tell you that when I was arrested, Aristarchus said, put me in jail with him. Well, you've done nothing wrong, Aristarchus. 
Yes, but I want to go to jail to serve him. When he went to Rome and the ship was having such difficulty, who was at his side? Aristarchus. What is Aristarchus doing there? Because they, wait a minute, they gave themselves to the Lord and they gave themselves to Paul. Now, we in our carnality, because we're critical, not here, but in many places you'll hear cri critical statements about the church this week. Let me tell you one of them you'll hear. Well, I'll tell you what. I think people ought to serve the Lord, follow the Lord. But I'll tell you what. I ain't for following no man, brother. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The only God you know to follow is the God who's chosen to live in the hearts of humanity. I've not seen God with these eyes. And I question anybody's theology that claims they've seen him. But I've seen his activity in lives that he's changed for the glory of God. I got saved listening to a preacher and following the instruction from that blessed book that I'd never owned. I was baptized because that preacher said, the Bible says you ought to be baptized. I didn't know the Bible. I followed that man. Because he was following the Lord. And just for the record's sake, for those of you who are a little uneasy in what I said, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul speaking, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, follow me as I follow him. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he said it on two occasions in the book of Corinthians. Well, that was the Thessalonian. The Thessalonian. Now remember, wait a minute, we're talking about the church at Macedonia, so let's keep it in the context. Where did Aristarchus come from? He was a Thessalonian. Well, wait a minute, you said that Macedonia was uh, Thessalonica, Philippi, and Berea. That the only illustration you got? I got one more. Don't be picking on me. Got another one. The other one comes from uh, Philippi. His name, Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is a Greek name that translates charming. And I'm telling you, this, this fellow was flat charming in his life. Well, let's see. If, well, stay with me. What, what, what are we dealing with? We're dealing in verse number five. That he did not do as we had hoped. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us, Paul and the leaders, by the will of God. Listen to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Who is he? This is Paul talking about sending him back to the church at Philippi. He's my brother. He's a fellow worker. He's a, he's a fellow soldier. But he's your messenger and the one who he ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and he was distressed because you'd heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick. Almost unto death. Where, where is he sick and almost unto death? He's over in the city of Rome. He's visiting uh, Paul in prison. And while he's there, he's about to die. And then he makes this statement. He said, but God had mercy on him. And by the way, people die when they get sick unless God has mercy on them. And the Bible says, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He said, God had mercy on me because if Epaphroditus came over here for me and died, I would have been sorrowful. So God had mercy on me. Therefore, I send him to you more eagerly. I'm sending him back. Thank you for sending him over. Why did he send Epaphroditus? Are you with me? Because the church at Philippi, the church at Philippi was the only church we have record of in the New Testament that ever gave a love offering to the Apostle Paul. That's an incredible statement I just made. I'd like to have been a member of the church in the first century that believed in supporting people like the Apostle Paul. So listen to this. He said, therefore, I send him to, to the more eagerly that when you see him again, because y'all hadn't seen him for a while, he's been over here in Rome, you may rejoice and I be and be less sorrowful. And listen to this. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with gladness and hold such in esteem. Because, here it is, for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service to me. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. Why did Epaphroditus, Brother Jim, do what he did? Because he had first given himself to the Lord and then to Paul. He gave himself to the Savior and to his servants. You see, when grace comes into your life, no longer is it all about you. It's now about him and others. And when somebody's out there doing the work of God, they go. 
So I want to close with these statements. Can I get an amen that I'm going to close? Besides my wife. Thank you very much. God bless you. You've always wanted to do that. And I'm in such a good mood. I still love you. It's grace. <laughs> now, here's some, here's some simple statements I wrote down. It's certainly not new. But I want you to hear these concluding statements. Number one, if we give ourselves to God, we will have little problem giving our substance to God. Number one. See, the real struggle when you're trying to write a check or give a gift, not just here, but a missionary gift, uh, one of your friends, I was in a little group this morning, see you back there, Cece, uh, in our group this morning, they made the appeal of some of the, the needs y'all have in South Africa. The challenge would be in my life is not writing the check because I don't want to give my substance to that ministry. It's because I'm still struggling with holding on to my own life instead of giving it to God as I ought. Number two, if we give ourselves to God, we'll have little problem giving ourselves to others. Number three, it is impossible to experience grace and ignore the needs of our neighbors. Number four, I'm through. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the New Testament. We, we wonder at times, how, how's it supposed to work? What's the church supposed to look like? And you literally have given us a blueprint. You've given us the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. You have taken us through the book, the Bible, and shown us how we operate. Help us, help me, Lord, to make sure every area of my life is not only surrendered to God, but continually surrendered. There's times I sense I take back. I'm an Indian giver. Help me to keep my hands open my heart open to hear from you and to give of my time, to give of my talents, and to give of my treasures. Thank you for the marvelous Gentile illustration of Macedonia. In Jesus' name.